Jerome, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, and on behalf of the Aspen Institute and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, I want to welcome you here as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Medicare. Anyone who's been around uh, the, the LBJ staff and family has a number of great stories, but one of my favorites is about uh, LBJ in 1965. LBJ was a massacre getting things done, as we'll hear later this morning. And one of the things he knew is that if you wanted to do not something nice for somebody, you did something nice for their children. And so during the course of 1965, and what was the first uh, year of uh, his presidency in his own right, he decided to throw a carnival on the South Lawn of the White House for lawmakers and their families. And it fell to Bess Abel, the White House secretary, social secretary, to organize that event. One of the things she had to do is to order crystal balls for the fortune telling tent. And so she called a manufacturer uh, somewhere in the United States and, and they began chatting and she told him exactly what she wanted and he finally asked her, well, where do you want me to send these? And there was, uh, and she said, the White House. And there was a pregnant pause on the other end of the line and the gentleman said, the president knows these don't work, right? <laughs> well, if the president had a crystal ball that worked in 1965, he would have seen what an endemic part of American life Medicare has become, and he would have been thrilled with this conference, where we will look at how LBJ got Medicare passed when, when others had failed. We'll look at the evolution of Medicare as, a, as an endemic part of American life, and we'll look at the lessons that we have learned from Medicare and its evolution. When President Johnson signed Medicare into law with former President Harry Truman at his side 50 years ago, he said, no longer will this nation refuse the hand of justice to those who gave a, gave a lifetime of service and wisdom and labor to the progress of this progressive nation. Today, we are honored to commemorate the signing of this landmark bill with two great partners, the Aspen Institute, uh, which was instrumental in the planning of the conference, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, who has been so generous in its support. These two institutions have a remarkable record of advancing the dialogue on so many issues relating to health care. A couple of uh, uh, housekeeping uh, things. First of all, we are videotaping today's proceedings, so I'll ask you to either shut your phones off or put them in, into the uh, vibrating mode. We'll have three panels this morning with two breaks. Uh, when we're done at about 12.15, we'll invite you all to join us for lunch on the second floor where you can talk to many of those in the audience and who are, will be on stage today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Risa Levizo More, President and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Risa earned her medical degree from Harvard Medical School before embarking on a distinguished career as a specialist in geriatrics. She has served as president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation since 2003, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Risa Levizo More. Well, great. Thank you, Mark, for that wonderful introduction and that great story. I'm going to have to use that in the future. It uh, is really an honor to be here with so many distinguished people who clearly uh, care about this historic occasion and, and uh, care about how to improve the nation's quality of health care and access to health care. You know, 50 years ago, uh, President, when President Johnson signed uh, Medicare and Medicaid into law, he made a promise that our country would provide care for those who need it the most. He called for an end to the system that denied uh, aging Americans the, as he put it, the healing miracle of modern medicine. And he rejected that illness should have the power to, as he said, destroy the hopes and fortunes of people at the expense of caring for their loved ones. And if you think about, as Mark said just now, it's remarkable, um, not only how far we've come, but how those, those words still ring true today. 
because Medicare and Medicaid have really been a driving force in improving uh, our nation in so many ways. And as a physician and as a geriatrician who practiced for many years in the diverse communities of Philadelphia, I know very well the powerful impact that these programs have on everyday Americans. I've seen personally uh, the relief in patients' faces when they know it's gonna be all right because they have Medicare or Medicaid. And I'm certain that if President Johnson were here and could see that uh, more than 100 million Americans are now covered by the programs that he signed into law, uh, he, and that they are very much a part of our national identity, we'd probably see that big Texas grin that has become so much a, a part of what those of us in policy look to uh, as uh, a, a um, inspiration. And uh, I think he would be very happy to know that we're continuing to try to improve Medicare and Medicaid, um, and particularly that they are the base on which we are building many of the, the most significant changes in healthcare today. Whether you think about um, the health insurance exchanges or the ways that we are expanding Medicaid eligibility in so many states, or the drive to improve the value that we get from health care that is a part of uh, the most recent legislation just last night, the Dr. Fix that happily passed with bipartisan support. So these changes, which are among the most significant that we've seen in health care since 1965, are starting to pay off. Uh, we now see millions of Americans enrolling and re-enrolling in health care coverage, some of them for the first time. In the last two years alone, the rate of uninsured in this country has decreased by 35%. And there are Americans all over the country who have uh, affordable, low-income adult Americans who have affordable health insurance for the first time in their, in their life. So the Affordable Care Act has really built on President Johnson's vision, and uh, we are seeing that many more Americans finally get the health care that they need and deserve. But there's still more to do. So we have to aim to close that coverage gap in every state so that those who remain uninsured will actually get insurance. We have to help consumers not only get enrolled, but understand how to get the most out of their new benefits. And we have to become increasingly steadfast in examining new ways to improve the quality of care and the value of care so that we get the most from every single dollar that we spend on health care in this country. What we did 50 years ago, we must continue to do for generations to come. And so over the last uh, year or so, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has been talking to policymakers and educators and members of the faith community, moms and dads, really ordinary Americans, any, real, anyone who would talk to us, frankly, um, about how we can improve health in every single community across the country. And in those conversations, Medicaid and Medicare are an essential part of the conversation because what they provide goes beyond health coverage. They provide uh, a reduction or opportunity to reduce inequity and to reduce disparities. And they let us know that the fundamental value that we have in this country, that everyone matters, is really alive and important to us. Where you live, how much you earn, uh, what your circumstances are, should not be a predictor of your opportunity to lead a healthy life. So we're really trying to work together to build a culture of health that enables everyone in our diverse society to be as healthy as they possibly can. And to achieve health and, do, and to make sure that being healthy is not a luxury for many and an impossibility for some. Now, 50 years ago, President Johnson inspired the nation by quoting from the Old Testament. He said, thou shalt hold out thine hand to the needy, to thy brother, 
to everyone in need in our land. And so today, we celebrate the values on which Medicare and Medicaid were built, but we also commit ourselves to making them even better. So that 50 years from now, people sitting in a room like this will be able to look at a solid century of care and caring in this country. So thank you for being here. Risa, thank you very much, and thank you again for, for your support of this event. Our next speaker is Mary Wakefield, the acting director or acting deputy secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. President Obama previously named Mary as administrator of the Health Resources and Services Administration in 2009. I'm proud to mention that she uh, earned both master's and doctoral degrees uh, in nursing at the University of Texas at Austin, the campus where the LBJ library sits. Hook them horns, Mary. Uh, please Mar uh, welcome Mary Wakefield. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone. Secretary Burwell is out of the city today, so she asked me to uh, join all of you on her behalf. Uh, she certainly sends her warmest regards. And as this is actually my first uh, official speaking role as Acting Deputy Secretary, I also want to say that I cannot think of a better opportunity or event in which to participate. So thank you for the invitation. Of course, we're all here to mark an historic event that has positively impacted the lives of millions of Americans, including, no doubt, the family members of every individual in this room. That, of course, was President Johnson signing Medicare and Medicaid into law. Even before that, though, the need for change had been clearly identified. On his watch, President Truman had become alarmed, for example, by the sheer number of draftees who had failed their physicals during World War II. In fact, the number of men rejected for military service was about 30% of all of those examined. And the numbers were similar for the Women's Army Corps. So while need for it was clear, the idea of broadly available health insurance coverage was a fairly new one at that time. Actually, in the 1940s, nearly one out of four individuals were uninsured. And of course, more than half of the elderly were uninsured. So on November 19, 1945, President Truman sent a 5,000 word letter to Congress outlining the problems and proposing a five-part plan to address those problems, as he saw them. The letter addressed everything from constructing more hospitals to sickness and disability wage loss insurance. It wasn't light reading, but occasionally his personality in that document comes through. After making this point several times earlier, Truman writes, quote, I repeat, what I am recommending is not socialized medicine, end quote. Naturally, it was labeled socialized medicine, and so no surprise, it didn't get anywhere during his term. But 20 years later, he was beside President Johnson at the Harry S. Truman Library to sign one of the most transformative bills in history. At that signing in 1965, President Truman laid out the true heart behind Medicaid and Medicare, saying, quote, these people are our prideful responsibility, and they are entitled, among other benefits, to the best medical protection available. So then and now, our obligation to the men and women who have come before us, to our parents and our grandparents, to our teachers and mentors, our neighbors and friends. That obligation is clear. We stand on their shoulders. We work in the industries that they built. We follow the paths that they paved. We know that in their later years, we owe them something. We owe them something other than indignity, other than poverty, other than treatable illness. 
and for those children and mothers and families who have struggled to keep food on the table, for those whose health stood between them and a paycheck or going back to school. We know that the path then and the path forward must not leave them behind. And I think that it is more than our responsibility. I think that that is our honor. We have made a promise that our nation will take care of our citizens, that addressing the health of our most vulnerable people is a value that we believe in and one that we intend to uphold. And we do that with pride. For 50 years now, Medicaid and Medicare have helped us fulfill that promise to our seniors, to those living with disabilities, and to the most vulnerable families among us. When Medicare was enacted in 1965, the elderly were the most likely age group to be poor, and the average life expectancy then was 70 years old. Today, the elderly experience poverty at about the same rate as working age adults, and the average life expectancy is nearly 79 years old. For 50 years, millions of Americans have been supported through these services. They've been able to get care when they need it most and take care of themselves before they become ill. And in 2014, so just last year, Medicare and Medicaid combined covered nearly 117 million people. And for 50 years now, both programs, both Medicare and Medicaid, have evolved, have improved in the provision of health care. Additionally, Medicare has become one of the single most popular programs, and Americans have come to know that they can rely on it. Clearly, as we look forward to the next 50 years, Medicare and Medicaid continue to have an important role to play in both ensuring access to health care and certainly in the evolution of our nation's healthcare delivery system. And so, looking forward, there is more work to do. As a nurse, as far back as I can recall, decades certainly, our healthcare system has struggled to deliver affordable, quality healthcare for many Americans. Too often, we pay more to get less. Quantity of tests is incentivized over quality of care. Volume is prioritized over value, and specific health care conditions are addressed while a patient's complete health care picture is often overlooked. But going forward, in partnership with others, we have a strategy to address that. If we can find better ways to deliver care, to pay providers, and better ways to distribute and make information available, Focusing on those activities, we can make improvements that provide better care to patients, spend dollars more wisely, and support healthier people and healthier communities. We all benefit when we have a better and a smarter and a healthier system. And since so many consumers are part of Medicare and Medicaid, through these programs, we have a unique position to build, out the, to build that system out. Thanks to changes from the Affordable Care Act, we're already making some progress. With improvements made to Medicare-supported health care delivery, among other changes, we've driven down Medicare hospital readmissions by nearly 10% last year. And we just announced today savings to taxpayers of $316 billion. We've also seen a dramatic decrease in patient harm, reducing hospital-acquired infections by 17% since 2010, saving us billions in unnecessary costs and also saving lives. And of course, we've helped more than 16 million people find quality, affordable health insurance through the marketplace. It is a good start, but all of us know that we can and we need to do more. In January at HHS, we set a goal of moving 30% of all Medicare payments to alternative payment models, such as accountable care organizations, bundled payments, and patient-centered medical homes, and to do that by 2016. And more importantly, the goal was set of 50% by 2018. This focus will help providers move from being paid by the test and procedure that is paying for quantity, to focusing on the care and health of patients, that is, paying for care quality. We're also focused on transforming Medicaid through improved practices and a focus on care quality. 
Our CMS Innovation Center has a number of initiatives in Medicaid that are helping us to move the needle, like the Medicaid Innovation Accelerator Program, Medicaid Incentives for the Prevention of Chronic Diseases Model, and the Strong Start for Mothers and Newborns Initiative. We're also focused on improving services for people who are du dual eligible, often the folks who are, have the most complex and highest costs. We are leading where we can, but we also know that we can't do it alone. So we're working with insurers, providers, businesses, and consumer advocacy groups to find the best solutions and build on so much of the progress that they have led over the past several years. Working together within our reach is a better, a smarter, and a healthier system. Before I was named Acting Deputy Secretary, I served as the Administrator of the Health Resources and Services Administration, where in that operating division of HHS, our main objective was to connect uninsured, isolated, and medically vulnerable people with care. Needless to say, through HRSA's programs, we do a great deal of work with Medicaid and Medicare and Affordable Care Act programs. So for me, it's been refreshing to have solutions to long-standing problems. It's been absolutely amazing to see the kind of impact that these programs can make in people's lives. They truly are life-changing. Far back when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act, he explained that it represented, quote, a cornerstone in a structure which is being built, but is by no means complete. And President Johnson echoed those words 50 years ago as well. Medicare and Medicaid, like Social Security before it, and like the Affordable Care Act now, are about more than the services that comprise them. They are about who we are as a nation. They are about meeting the needs of our people and about never leaving families or friends or neighbors behind. And like other foundational programs, they are by no means complete. As we look to the next 50 years and beyond, it is our obligation, and I think it's our prideful responsibility to continue to improve, to continue to innovate, and to continue to ensure that every American has the resources that they need to live healthy and productive lives. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you for all you do at HHS. Uh, it's now my great privilege to introduce Congressman John Conyers. Congressman Conyers has represented Michigan's 13th congressional district since that seminal year in American history, 1965, when the 89th Congress passed Medicare and Medicaid. This is the Congressman's 26th term in the House of Representatives. You'll hear in a minute Congressman Conyers uh, and the unique role that he played in the passage of the Medicare and Medicaid bill for all qualified Americans. During his long and distinguished career, he has also served as chairman of the House Committee on, on the Judiciary and was a founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Congressman Conyers has spent half a century fighting for equal justice and the protection of civil rights for all Americans, and we are privileged to have him here today. Congressman Conyers. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be here. You may now call me the Dean of the Congress, um, which is just another way of saying uh, that there's nobody been around longer than myself. Uh, I wanted to begin by congratulating uh, the Aspen Institute and uh, the LBJ Presidential Library, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, uh, for bringing us all together. And it's a pleasure to reflect on this important uh, part of our legislative direction uh, in uh, 
this country, uh, the 50th anniversary of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, now, I am a devotee of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He impressed me more than any one human being I've ever met in my life, inspired me. I've tried to think about how I actualize what he fought for, dreamed of, and, and worked to organize this on. And uh, <clears throat> he, he said that uh, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. <clears throat> I hope you believe that uh, because there are a lot of other things that are just as bad. I mean, getting uh, falsely imprisoned uh, is one that I think of, and uh, getting rid of the death penalty, which we've been working toward, is another thing that is shocking and inhumane. But we commemorate uh, 50 years since LBJ signed Medicare and Medicaid uh, into law and transform health care for seniors and with Medicaid low-income uh, Americans and Medicaid. Uh, this was the first piece of legislation, and I'm probably the only one around in the Congress that was here in 65. I don't, I don't remember anybody uh, that was here when this happened, and I had just got to Congress, and this is the bill that I first introduced uh, that year. It was my my big bill. I was very impressed uh, with its importance and significance, and still am. Still am. Now, the 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 only thing I wanted to add to the beautiful presentation you've already been treated to is that this bill in 1965 ended segregation in health care. Uh, we don't even think about that now, but uh, there was a strictly enforced segregation of health care in our system. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, throughout the South, it was strictly enforced but in many places in the North, it was enforced as well. Or you were sent, if, if you were African-American, to second-rate care. There was a, a two-tier system if there was anything at all uh, in many places. And the few African-American doctors there were couldn't even uh, practice in most hospitals. And that all changed in 65 uh, uh, for to get the federal funding through Medicare. Uh, you, we had to require that hospitals uh, obey the provisions of the civil rights legislation just passed a year earlier, which required integrating the facilities. Uh, uh, and there was monitors sent around for Compliance, and it, it worked. Uh, it worked pretty well in in ending segregation. A huge step forward. Now, uh, we've we've got some uh, ex some tremendous work in front of us. You see, the uh, there's still two s schools of thought uh, about. Healthcare. Uh, one is to uh, contract it, to clip away some of the benefits, and uh, my conservative colleagues have gotten very expert at uh, chipping away a little bit pieces at a time. Uh, fortunately, I have some of my conservative colleagues that are now embracing this. Uh, fully without restriction, but they're few in number. What we're trying to do is expand uh, 
the two schools of thought is, one, let's privatize health care. Oh boy, that's that would be the last that would be the last straw. You 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 know that's not going the right way. And the other view uh, is let's expand uh, Medicare coverage. And so I uh, uh, have introduced H.R. 676, the uh, Medicare for all, regardless uh, for everybody, regardless of status, age, wealth, location, and uh, uh, it, it is called H.R. 676, uh, and it's uh, Medicare for all. Now, this is moving toward my ultimate goal. I might as well just privately let you know about it today. <laughs> Look, single-payer Medicare for everybody uh, is the goal, uh, and that gets rid of all the... Medicare, Medicaid, <clears throat> Affordable Care Act. We just had a big fight on, on extending uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act, and there are people that still want to cut back on it. And, and now there's a big battle going on in the Congress to reduce the... Uh, <clears throat> Medicare benefits by cutting it. Uh, so uh, I, I want you to know the battle still goes on. There, the two schools are still at it. One, let's reduce it and pri or privatize it, and let's expand it and have a system uh, where everybody's covered, uh, period. And, uh, and uh, of course, I... I'm proud to join the latter group as, as we keep this battle going forward. I congratulate you and the organizations that are presenting this today, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Congressman, for those remarks and for your many years of service to our nation.